right, so today we are in the good and trustworthy servant part 21, and we're dealing with trustworthy part 10, okay? So that's the elements there, All right? Now, this may be the last one for this part, right? Then we're gonna go into servant. I'm gonna see how, how much we can get this done today. Um, I'm only gonna be dealing with Matthew 25, but we are gonna deal with the entire chapter. So that could take a little while, depending on how much Abba inspires me to stop here and there and, and discuss a few things, okay? Now, so we're gonna go through this, and I'm gonna start breaking things down. Now remember, in chapter 25, we have what launched us into all of this, which was the parable of the talents, where we have in verse 21, and his master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy servant, you are trustworthy over a little, I will set you over much, enjoy, excuse me, enter into the joy of your master. Of course, he says that again, further down in verse 23, okay? Now, that was where we started 21 parts ago. So this, of course, is where we need to wrap up. But what we have in this chapter is you have three parables, okay? And those three parables are connected, shouldn't be surprising. And I think we're gonna discover some interesting things as we connect them together. Now, and I think it really has a lot to do with trustworthy. So let's begin at the beginning of the chapter in verse one. And then we're gonna go through these three parables. We're gonna start with verses one through 12, we're in Matthew 25, and we're gonna be dealing with the first parable, okay? Then the rain of the heaven shall be compared to 10 maidens who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. You guys should all be very familiar with this, right? And the five of them were wise and five foolish. Those who were foolish, having taken their lamps, took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their containers with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom took time, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, see the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those maidens rose up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in, went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. And later the other maidens also came saying, Master, Master, open up for us. But he answered saying, truly I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, okay, before we get into, okay, we'll just go into verse 13 to finish that. Watch therefore because you do not know the day or the hour in which the son of Adam is coming. All right, now, so this first parable, now what's a parable? It's the father trying to communicate to us by telling a story of some sort that we're not supposed to be looking at the story literally. We're supposed to be saying, what is he trying to teach us through this story? So it's not about literally you need to be worried that when Yeshua returns that you have oil and a lamp. Okay, you don't need to have oil and a lamp. Well, what is he using these metaphors to teach us? That's the key, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. I'm not gonna answer the question yet because the other two parables explain, you ready for this, what the oil is. I don't think you probably ever heard that from anybody before, okay? Everybody just reads about the parable of the, the maidens and the oil and then tries to explain. I think in reading the whole thing together that the other two explain what the oil is, okay? So let's just have that, so basically what we have, let's kind of summarize what we do have here. We've got a comparison of a group of people. You can call them wheat and tares. You can call them anything you want. Some of the group is prepared. Whatever that looks like, oil, lamps, etc. there's a, a percentage of the group here, half of them are prepared with whatever was expected to be ready with. Oil is the metaphor being used here, right, to picture that. The other half is not prepared. Okay, the other half is not prepared. And then all of a sudden, this is the funny part. This is for all of you that think, oh, I'm just gonna mess around until he like, basically shows up and then I'm gonna straighten everything out. This parable is to teach you that does not work. That does not fly. Okay, this also undermines the whole deathbed confession nonsense and last minute confession nonsense, okay? That's not the way it works. He wants to see that you've lived a life from whatever point that starts, right? Not like your entire life. Obviously, he didn't bubble pop you when you were born. And so you've lived a section of life till the end from wherever you started, bearing some sort of oil, creating some sort of oil, whatever the oil is supposed to be picturing. We're gonna get into that in the next two parables, okay? Now, 
bear in mind that whatever this oil is determined whether or not you got to go to the wedding feast. Because they didn't have oil they had to go get because they couldn't just show up without the oil, whatever the oil is. The other thing is, even when they went out, because it says that then they showed up, we're going to assume they showed up after kind of straightening out whatever it is the oil was, and now they showed up at the last minute saying, well, let us in. Now, it doesn't say if they have oil or not at this point, but we can assume that it actually the, the instruction or the information we can learn from it goes well either way. Let's assume for a second that they showed up without oil. Obviously, they're not getting in. Or they showed up with oil that they got at the last second, and they're still not getting in. Why? Because look what he says. He says, they say, Master, open up to us. And he says, look what he says. He doesn't say, hey, where's your oil? He says, I don't know you. Which is the same thing we see in Matthew 24. You know, where they're going to say, not, not, not Matthew 24. In the other uh, place where you see where he says, Master, Master. And he says, I didn't know you. Get away from me. You workers of iniquity. Right? Hmm. It's the same message there. He says, I don't know you. So what brings the knowing about? Now, if you've been listening to me for any period of time, you know that I have taught you that knowing is not informational, it's relational. It's relational. Which means that when he said, I don't know you, he's saying, we do not have the relationship you think we have. I haven't said this in a while, but you've heard me say this a lot if you've been watching for enough years, where I used to say to you all the time, you are not the one that gets to decide whether or not you have a relationship with him. He does. He decides what your relationship is. Because I've had so many of you tell me, oh, me, me and the creator, we're so close. I'm glad you feel that way. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. He gets to decide that, not you. Because those people that said, master, master, Lord, Lord, they all thought, I mean, I don't see any other way to interpret it. They all thought they had a relationship with him. You know, you're our master and we did all these things in your name. What do you mean, you know? There's a problem here. He says, no, no. You were working iniquity. You were not doing what I said, and we don't have the relationship you thought we had. He is the one who determines whether or not you have a relationship. So be careful with that, because you can walk around thinking that you and the Messiah, you and the Father, whatever the church taught you, or whatever you just felt in your heart, oh, we're so close. Well, not if you're not walking around with the right, having oil. If you don't have oil, what are you going to be doing? The oil is the key. What you're looking at here, okay, what you're looking at here is the relationship. When they came to him, they said, Master, Master, he already gives us a little hint here to connect to that also, what this oil is all about. Some of it has, something about it has to do with how you're walking and whether you're walking in Torah and truth or you're walking in iniquity. What's iniquity? Breaking the Torah, okay? Doing what you should, it's law, the real word would be lawlessness, in the, in the Greek translated from the Hebrew that would have been underlying that, it would have been, go away, walk, you know, I don't know you, you workers of lawlessness. Okay, anomia in the Greek, right? Lawlessness. Because somebody might make an argument, well, iniquity isn't really the same thing. Well, that's what the word actually means. It means lawlessness. Now, what law would he be talking about? The law from above, the Torah. So this oil is going to have something to do with Torah observance. I mean, he's making that connection. Five have oil, five don't. And then, of course, they go to sleep because he's delaying in some way. And then they wake up and they're told he's coming. And the five realize, uh-oh. See, all of you procrastinators and last minute, whatever, you're going to be in trouble if you're going to do this with your covenant walk. You can't do that at the last minute. You might get to do a project for work at the last minute or some school project at the last minute. This isn't going to cut it. You have to be in a journey of becoming him. So that when your end comes or when the announcement of the wedding feast comes, you've done the doing that's required. That's going to be the oil. You're going to see this through the other parables. But he already gives us a hint here in verse 11, uh, excuse me, um, verse 12. Well, verse 11, they say, master, master. And his response to master, master, to the ones without the oil is, I don't know you. Wow. And he then warns him and says, look, watch therefore. This is for the people who are hearing the story because you don't know when he's coming. So you better have your oil, whatever that is, right? And we're already starting to see a little bit of what that looks like. Now let's assume our first scenario is we assume they didn't have oil. 
Now let's assume that they knock it on the door and they actually went and got it, so to speak. In other words, they decided how they're gonna, now I'm gonna walk this out right. Well, that last minute change is not of any value. You know why? Because I know you know this from your own experience. How many of you have had somebody in your life who was doing things you did not appreciate and you told them so, and they apologized and said, oh, no, 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 I'm gonna be good from now on, and that lasted how long? Did it last forever? Did it last sometimes no more than like a day? Because people will say what they want to say, what they need to say to get what they want. Not to say that never is somebody genuine, but often enough, what do you need to know? You need to see it. You need to see it actually walked out, right? You have a problem in a relationship, you might say, okay, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt that you're serious. Let me see how that plays out for the next six months. Let's see if you can keep what you just said if you're serious. The only way to know is to watch it play out. You can't know just because the person said it. And he's all like, I don't have a relationship with you. Oh yeah, I'm real excited maybe that you just finally figured it out, but it's a little too late at this point. And the only reason you figured it out is because you're now motivated by missing out on something. By the way, that's the weeping and gnashing of teeth that you read about in Revelation. Because people think, why is it weeping and gnashing of teeth? Because they're realizing it doesn't work the way they thought it did. Not, wait, listen, it's not it didn't work the way that they were told by wrong people. They were told how it really works. You don't get weeping and gnashing of teeth unless your bubble was popped and you were told the right way and you didn't do it. Okay, nobody ends up in the weeping and gnashing of teeth who's never had their bubble popped and never had a chance to understand what's right and what's wrong and make those choices. Remember, making decisions is the reason you exist. That's the teaching that's real important. You may want to listen to that on a regular basis. It's one part, listen to it every month for a while, get it. You have to get it. How you make choices is everything. It's everything. So these people, let's assume that they came to whatever the oil is, you'll see. Let's say they decided, I'm going to do this now. And he's like, yeah, but I haven't seen you make decisions. I haven't seen you tempted to not do what you just said. I haven't seen you tempted to do something else. I haven't seen how you make decisions. Well, the decision I see you making now is that you're panicked, you're gonna miss out on something. Because now all of a sudden it's real. The wedding is here. Those people that are lined up, weeping and gnashing of teeth, are sitting there going, he meant what he said. I don't get to just do whatever I want. So they're not weeping and gnashing of teeth for any other reason except that they're not gonna get to have their cake and eat it too, essentially. I do whatever I want and I get to be in the kingdom. That's the weeping and gnashing of teeth, all right? Okay, now, don't, don't for a second believe that they're really genuinely repentant. Anybody have a kid do something stupid, you go to punish them and they're weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, I'm so sorry, please don't punish me, please don't take away my toy, I'll never do it again. And then five minutes later after their punishment's over, they did it again. Because they weren't serious, they just didn't want the punishment. These people here aren't serious either. They just didn't want to miss out on the wedding. Does that make any sense? Are we getting somewhere with that? Okay? Now, let's go forward and see how this plays out in the rest of the parables here. So he said, watch therefore, because you do not know the day or the hour in which the Son of Adam is coming. By the way, can all of you, <laughs> all of you end time fanatics, especially the ones who sell books and videos, all you pastors, preachers, whatever. Can you please all shut up? Stop selling, it's gonna be this year, it's gonna be this week. It's, he said, nobody knows. So stop claiming you know. Oh my gosh, it's like a, an epidemic every year. September 23rd, September 23rd. Or, oh, these blood moons, oh, this, that, or the other thing. Listen, <laughs> some of you think nobody knows is a challenge. Like he's throwing the gauntlet at you and saying, I challenge you to figure it out. That's not a challenge, it's a statement of fact. You don't know. It wasn't a statement of fact saying, well you don't know and you need to figure it out. He says you need to have your lamps full so that you're prepared whenever it is. Figuring it out is not the goal. Figuring, well at least figuring out when he's coming. Figuring it out is the goal of what you need to be doing. You need to figure that out. What do I need to be doing? Because let's face it, we never know how much time we really have. Okay, some of you are gonna live to be 90. Some of you are not gonna make it to 70. I don't know who's who. I'm not just talking about this room, I'm saying like everybody watching. 
Because nobody knows how long they have. Everybody knows people that live to be like 90 and people that died early like in their 40s and 50s. We all know people like that. Whether it's by accident or disease or cancer or something, we know people that died young. Nobody saw it coming. So I don't think you see it coming either. All right? That being said, you're told to prepare though because you know what's coming. You don't know when, but you know what's coming. So now he says, he says, no, it's no, nobody knows the day or the hour. Now listen now to the next verse. For it is like a man going from home who called his own servants and delivered the possessions to them. Oh, so now he's back to, this isn't like, wait a minute, no one knows the hour? But then he says, for it is like a man going home. So this is like, oh, okay, hmm, what is this talking about? And he delivered his possessions to them, and to one he gave the five talents, now we got the parable of the talents, to another two and another one, and to each according to his own ability, and went from home. And he who received the five went and worked with them and made five more. In the same way, the one with the two made two more. But he who, I know I'm not reading exactly the words word for word, so don't get mad at me, I'm wondering what translation I'm reading here, all right? But he who had received one went away and dug in the ground and hid the silver of his master. So what are we told that silver is? Silver is something valuable. What are we told is more precious than silver and more precious than gold? The word, the Torah, the teachings and instructions from above. So we're getting a little bit of a connection here that he's talking about silver, okay? And he goes that he hid it in the ground and after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five came and brought five, the five extra and said to his master, look, you deliver me five and see I've gained five more. And his master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy servant. You were trustworthy over little, I shall set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Then he who had received two talents came and he said, master, you delivered me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents beside them. And his master said, well done, good and trustworthy servant. You were trustworthy over a little, I shall set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, looking at this, one of the reasons we hear the word good is that they're called good because they were trustworthy, okay? We already defined good in the first 10 or 11 parts of this, but I'm just saying here we see that the good part's ignored, the focus is you were trustworthy. Well done, you were trustworthy with what I gave you. And he who received the one, verse 24, Talent also came and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. And being afraid, I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Hmm. Now look what it's talking about here. This really gets confusing to people. He said, I knew you to be a hard man. Now I talked about this the other day about, listen, you need to be hard, not harsh, when you're talking to your children. In other words, be serious, mean what you say, create very strict boundaries, etc. Can we all agree Yahweh is not only gentle and compassionate, he's also hard. He means what he says and he's not playing around. Even though he's overflowing with patience and, and compassion and mercy. Okay, but I would call him hard, all right? If, with that definition. But then it says, weeping where, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered. So this is a person whose head's on wrong. See, nobody's reaping, okay? And nobody's gathering unless he provided the seed. He gave him the talent, which is the same metaphor, and that he should have made something with that talent. Abba gives you the gifts and talents to do what you do to provide yourself with sustenance. So he still provided you, then you had to do the rest, but he still had to provide you. So this guy is confused. This particular servant is confused. He's saying, I know you to be a hard man. You reap what you hadn't sown and you gather what you hadn't done. He says, he's missing the, he's missing the whole picture. You know, Deuteronomy 8, it talks about, hey, he is the one who gives you the power to create wealth. He's the one that blesses you with these things. But yet you still have to create the wealth. He gives you the power to do it. He just doesn't give you the wealth. So this, this particular servant is screwed up in every possible way. He did nothing with the talent. And he didn't even understand that he can't do anything. 
gathering, you know, there's nothing to gather if the seed wasn't provided. There's nothing to harvest. There's nothing to, to sow, you know, unless the sowing was done. Well, you hadn't sown. What do you mean I hadn't sown? I didn't physically go and put the seed in the ground, but I gave you everything so you could put the seed in the ground. We're not seeing this correctly. At least this guy isn't. Now, if you're like him, you're not seeing things correctly. All right? So then you go, see, you have what is yours, which is funny because it's all his. <laughs> and his master answering said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Okay, if that's what you thought. You knew. This is what you thought. This is what your knowledge is. You think I, that this is what I do. Well, then why didn't you put my silver with the bankers? And at my coming, I would have at least received back my own with interest. Okay, therefore take away the talent from him and give it to him who possesses the ten. For to everyone who possesses, more shall be given. And everyone, excuse me, and he shall have overflowingly. But from him who does not possess, even what he possesses shall be taken away. Hmm. That's really interesting. So what is he talking about here? He says, first of all, at least you should have done something to increase what I gave you. And even if you're too lazy to do it, why don't you give it to the bankers? At least they would have done it, so to speak. All right? Which, by the way, you know, this could even be, I just thought of this now. I mean, this could even be a metaphor for giving to the ministry. At least the ministry could do something with it if you're not going to do anything with it. Okay? At least give it to somebody who could do something with it. So that when I come back, I can see that there's a, there's a fruit from that investment, so to speak. Now, Look at what he says here, though. He talks about possessing. Everyone who possesses, more shall be given. He who doesn't possess, etc. cetera. What does, mean, what does it mean to possess? It means take ownership that it's yours. Not yours that you can do whatever you want with. Yours that you're supposed to increase and multiply what was given to you. To do something with. Okay? This is all about what I've taught you with the very simple couple of steps to what revelation is, Right? Revelation is simply information revealed to you. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation, although it's the same thing. I'm just saying anything that has been revealed to you is simply information unless you do two things. You have to receive it. Well, he said, here's the talent, and they received it. But then the last step is you have to do something with it. And what you do with it is what's going to be the criteria of what you're judged on. This is the, this is the basis of your judgment. He gives, you receive, and now he watches and says, okay, let's see what you do with that. By the way, I do this with my children. You should do that with your children. You give them, see if they receive it, and see what they do with it. Sometimes it's guidance, advice. I'm not saying that you give them money and this and that. I'm saying just give them something and see what they do with it. By the way, I do that with all of you when you come to counsel. I'll reveal something to you, see if you receive it. And how am I going to know if you received it? Based on what you do with it. That's going to tell me how you received it. Some of you receive it and go, yeah, that guy's an idiot. I'm not listening to him, but you received it. You just received it as like, this guy's a jerk and I don't need to listen to him. Some of you received it and said, this is from Yah, I'm going to take it and do something with it. And so we just sit back the ministry and we watch to see what you do. Now, we're not judging you based on what you do. He is. We're just taking it as information that's now being revealed to us about you. Because I really will get to understand you a lot better when I watch what you do as opposed to what you say. Because what you do reveals a lot more, isn't it? Look, we all know the phrase where it says, you know, you know, people are going to pay much more attention to what you do than what you say. In other words, your actions speak louder than your words. Okay, we've all heard that. Your actions speak louder than your words. The thing is, the people in the first parable, their words is all they had. They had no actions. Okay, their actions showed them that it was all, the words were just, no, just words, empty words. Because they were 10 preparing for this return of the bridegroom, but only five did anything with it, so the, they all claimed a bunch of stuff, but half of them had empty words. And then they had the nerve to go to the ones who had and said, hey, I don't know what to do, I messed up. And they looked at them like, well, go find somebody that's gonna, it's not the buying and selling, by the way, this is not something you can buy, it says go to those that would instruct you, right? We're dealing with something here as a commodity, the oil, but it's a metaphor for what you should have been doing in your life. He said, well, you go find somebody to teach you and then start working this out. He said, you, you already dropped the ball. And by the way, let's not assume for a second they didn't have the right information. They did. But they had not embraced it. They had ignored it. They had let it go in and out the other ear, okay? 
They were not paying attention. They were not making use of this incredible gift they were given of understanding and information from above. That revelation. You know, everybody's all excited. Oh, I want, I want revelation. I'm revealing a bunch of stuff to you right now. But are you going to receive it? And I've watched a bunch of people get all excited like they're receiving, but then when it comes push comes to shove and they actually have to do something, it shows they didn't really receive it. Okay? Because the doing is everything, which is the opposite of what you hear on, most, on every Sunday from most places, and you hear that on Saturday from most places too. Because they're not going to tell you that what you do matters. They're going to tell you what you believe matters. But they're the same thing. Because your actions prove what you believe. James tells you that. Your actions are, the things that you do is your belief in action. It's the manifestation in the three-dimensional world, what you believe. It's, it's not complicated. Okay? You can claim you're Torah observant, and then I watch you do this or this and this, that clearly is not Torah observant, and then your actions are, tell me what you really believe. Okay? And so let's not misunderstand this. What you do is everything. Now, some of them are like, oh, well, then you're taking you know, God out of the mix. No. I'm saying that what you do matters and it's everything based on what he's given you. That's what the parable says. If he's given you a little bit, you're responsible for that little bit. As he gives you more, you're responsible for more. And so don't worry about if you don't have all that you need by the time, or like what you think you need. You'll always have all you need. But if you don't think you have everything that you think you need by the time he comes, as long as you've been a good steward of what he has given you, he said, I only gave you, you know, two talents and you got two more. Great. You were faithful in little, I'm going to give you much. Even the one with the five, he said, you were faithful in little, I give you more. All right? And the one could have done the same thing and turned it into two. And he would have gotten the same. That was great. He didn't ever said he was more excited about the five guy than the two guy. All right? He wasn't like, oh, well, you're, you know. He said, I gave him five. My expectation, he'd do more with it. I gave you two. My expectation, he'd do this. What you could do with that. I don't expect the two to be five. I only gave you two. But I expect, I would have been disappointing if the five only brought back two. He's trying to give you an understanding. I gave you, and I expect an, a measure back. I expect an equal response. Whatever I give you, I expect you to then perform and produce based on what I gave you. Hopefully we're getting this, all right? And can you see how this is now very much like the oil? Okay? The ones without oil, they're the ones where he says, you lazy and wicked servant. You were too lazy to get oil. You were too lazy to do the things you needed. That's really the problem. And, you know, I've talked about this a lot, but, you know, there's a real epidemic of laziness in this world. Okay, we got... Listen, you guys need to be thanking Yah every day, especially you lazy ones, that you don't live before electricity because you would never have made it. Because you are not... You, you're, you're too lazy. You wouldn't have made it. Some of you younger people, <laughs> you don't know what it was like not to have cell phones. Internet, tablets. I didn't have any of that growing up. And making phone calls were real expensive, so you didn't make them very often. And by the way, when you're on, you had somebody hovering over you looking at the watch going, because every minute was money. You paid for every minute. You guys get on your phones and you sit there and you talk for hours and hours and hours because it doesn't cost anything more than the one fee. That's not the way it used to be. So you guys don't have to care about those things because, you know, you know, it's all one price and that's the whole deal. But what, look into asking yourself. In, it, and by the way, some of you are really productive in some areas, but lazy in others. Some of you work like crazy and you're making a good living, but your relationships, you're very lazy. You're not putting the work in. Okay? And so your relationships hurt. Some of you have great relationships, but have no money which will hurt your relationships ultimately at some point because you're not working. Some of you have maybe good money and good relationships, but you don't have your vertical right because you're still doing what you want. 
Those three major areas in your life. Are you lazy in any of them? Are you putting in the effort where it needs to be? Because you don't want to hear, you know, you wicked and lazy servant. Why do you call them wicked? I think two reasons, right? One, he did what he wanted. He didn't do what he thought the master wanted. The others understood that the master wanted them to do something with what they gave him. Okay? So he called them wicked because he chose to do what he wanted and not what the master wanted. Also, he chose to judge the master harshly. And some of you do that occasionally when life is a little rough. You start looking at Yahweh like, you know, why are you doing this to me? And he's looking down at you going, I'm not doing anything to you. You're doing this to you. But you were raised, a lot of you, through Christianity where, you know, you wake up in the morning, stub your toe, you think, oh, he's trying to get your attention about something. No, maybe you just didn't look where you were going. Time and chance happen to everybody most of the time. He's not that involved. Now, don't get mad at me. I'm not all of a sudden becoming some new agey, like there is no God. I'm saying he has, in the, listen to the teaching, peace in the world, not his. He has his hands mostly in his pockets. He's not intervening. He's allowing us to do the stupid thing so we can see that doing it our way is stupid. It doesn't work. Okay? That's scriptural, by the way. He is mostly hands off. By the way, you see that even when he's working with Israel, he's mostly hands off with everybody else. So I'm not saying he doesn't do anything with you. He does just what needs to be done to keep you in understanding that he's there, he cares, and he's aware of what you're going through. Just enough, which is why you don't have everything and everything. Because if he gave that to you, you would be a, even more lazy and spoiled. So he wants you to, to kind of keep on your toes and working and aware. And he says, don't be like all slumbering and sleeping. We got the whole parable with the thief. We didn't talk about that one. But the same thing, right? The thief comes because the people were not paying attention. He says, you need to be paying attention. Same idea. You don't know when the Son of Man is coming. Now, it's not so much like you have to be like never sleeping. It's like you're asleep while you're awake. In other words, you're physically awake, but you're just walking through life in a, in a, in a half asleep because you're not thinking about the vertical. Look, pray always means be vertically aware always, which means be aware that whatever you're doing, he is aware of what you're doing. So you should be aware that he's aware and be really careful about what you're doing. So you're kind of keeping that connection clear. I know he's watching, so I need to pay attention to what I'm doing. Okay? So when it's Shabbat, you should be aware it's Shabbat and that he's watching what you do with that. When it's a holy day, he's watching what you do with that. When you go to the store to buy food or a restaurant to buy food, he's watching what your choices are. But if you're not aware of him, you may just go and do whatever. Look, I know, I'll give you a dumb example. Maybe it's a good example. Everybody's had this moment, pretty much. I was working at a hotel at the front desk many, 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 many years ago. And it was unleavened bread. And we had a thing at the hotel where, you know, once a week it was your turn to bring donuts. Because after all, working at the hotel, we all needed to be fat. So, you know. Um, I don't know what that has to do with anything. But anyway, for some reason we brought donuts. All right? So there was always free donuts every day. And wouldn't you know, unleavened bread starts... And I just walk in, see the donuts, pick one up, take a bite, because I wasn't thinking vertically for a second. Of course, after the bite, I was like, oops, and put it down, threw it out. I'm not gonna put it back down. I mean, I can't, nobody's gonna eat a donut I took a bite out of. Okay, threw it out. But the thing is, had I been vertically aware much more every moment 24 seven, I wouldn't have taken the bite. I just got into a comfortable routine of what normally happens and forgot when it was. It can happen to anybody because we have to be vertically aware at all times. Because if something is your normal routine, then you just may fall into that routine not thinking, okay? Being aware of what you're doing and where you're going. Look, I've had this problem too. I almost always come out of my, my, my uh, housing complex, development, whatever, drive down the road, and when I get to the main intersection, make a left to come here and do most things. But every now and then I need to go to the right, but almost always I'll go to the left and have to make a U-turn to come back because I'm not used to thinking going to the right. 
Because 90% of the time or more, I go to the left. You understand? So you get caught up in autopilot. And autopilot means you're doing what you normally do. When you're vertically aware, it's, you're, you're trying to make sure that whatever you're doing matches what he would have you be doing, right? But you gotta be vertically aware. Otherwise, you're gonna just be an autopilot. Do what you normally do. You know, I got my wife in the car. We know we're going to the right and that's where we're supposed to go. I'm talking to her. I'm an autopilot. I'm not thinking a lot. And boom, I make a left and she looks at me like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I was distracted. You know what's going to get you in the most, most trouble? Being distracted. This pray always is about being not distracted about the fact that there's a vertical that you need to be paying attention to. That you have an awareness at all times. Because whatever you're doing needs to be done in the context and framework of your relationship with him. This is not Christianity telling you you need to pray before you, know, you make every little decision of every little thing. You need to be vertically aware about everything that you're doing and every little decision you make and every little thing. Okay? So it's not like when you're going to buy a car, well, is there anything wrong with buying a car in Torah? No. Does he really care what color it is? No. Does he care what model it is? No. But you should be aware that he knows how dumb you are with your finances and he's watching to see how you're a steward of your finances if you buy something appropriate financially. Do you understand what I'm saying? The only part of the car purchase he cares about is how you're handling your money. Not because he really cares about your finances, but how you handle one thing is how you handle other things. Right? And so as long as you go in there and buy something that's financially appropriate, he's paying attention. He won't care what model, what brand, and what color. Okay? By the way, he also might be paying attention to whether or not what you're buying is appropriate to being a father or a mother with kids, and are you buying something conducive to everybody? Okay? Like if you selfishly go out and buy that two-door, only front seat, sporty car when you're a family person, and you don't even have a family car, that's a problem. Or you buy the two-seater truck, or you buy the two-seater anything when you got four people in the family. Now, if you already have a van or something that works for the, you know, or a big four-door car for the big family and you want to get something, see, that's different, right? But he's watching to see what kinds of decisions you make and how selfish they are. And you could buy something just for you as long as it's not important that it benefits somebody else also. Sometimes you could do things just for you. That's fine. But when the family doesn't have something and you're out there buying, okay, family doesn't even have a car that's reliable and you go out and buy a boat. What in the world do you need a boat for? Well, I want a boat. Well, the family needs a better car. You see what I'm saying? These kind of things he's paying attention to. How, are, how aware are you on what your family needs and not just what you want? Okay? This is important that we get this. All right? He watches. Some of you are very stubbornly broke and unemployed or underemployed because you refuse to do something that you don't like. But meanwhile, you're doing stuff you don't like anyway. Well, that job's beneath me, or that job's this. Who cares? Does it pay enough? It's slavery anyway. Okay? You're selling your, yourself to them for that time. So what do you care what you do? You're getting paid for your time. If you really want to like what you're doing, fine. Make a bunch of money, put it into the investment so that you can, get, can earn you money, and do whatever you want that doesn't even make money. You're all welcome to have careers doing anything that makes no money once you already have the money thing solved. Because you can then do whatever you want. Because you don't need the income. But he's watching how you handle things, the decisions you make. Don't you think the first parable was evidence that these people weren't thinking right? Don't you think the second parable, again, shows they weren't thinking right? I gave you the, the talents and the, and the mind and a heart to produce, and this is what you do? You sit around playing video games, you mind numbingly just watch TV or whatever it is, and you drink and whatever you do, smoke and stuff, and whatever you, you're doing all this stuff when your family doesn't have everything it needs. When you're not producing like you could. And he's like, I gave you, I gave you life for, to do this. So you sit on a couch and you goof off all day and all night and whatever. He says, I put you on the gift and what, what, what's here, the talents? More than with the first one, the talents is I gave you something and you increased it. You took the raw materials and made it into something better, 
more valuable. Okay? This is, okay, I give you as a gift some wood, some nails, and some other screws and things, and then you take that and you make it into a shed or a birdhouse or something. In other words, you take it and make it into something that's valuable instead of letting it sit in a pile somewhere. It's like, why'd I give it to you? He gives you everything you need. Every one of you is capable, without any problem, of doing more with the three big areas of your life. Your financial areas, your relationship areas, and your spiritual areas. Okay? You're all capable. Okay? Now, again, I'm always going to get the, well, I'm on disability, and this and this. Then work on the other two areas. But even some of you that are on fixed income don't handle your money very well. And then you're in trouble because you don't, want, you don't want to behave like you're on fixed income. So you can still fix that. All right? This is, this is critical because how you do, okay? So you know there's a saying always, as above, so below? Right? We all know that phrase. As above, so below. Let's reverse it. As below, so above. Meaning he's looking at you, how you do below, he's going to know that then you're going to do it above. Okay? Not that we're going above, but do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? As above, so below. Good. Okay? That's by, when he says this is the way things should be, that's the way it is also in the above. But he's also watching and saying, before I bring you into the kingdom, I expect you to be like the above, but I, but I know as you do below, that's how you're going to do it in the above, so to speak. Can we agree that that makes sense? Yeah. All right. I used to be a martial arts instructor. Okay? And when I taught my students, I said something very important to them. How you practice is how you'll do. So if you're going to sit here practicing faking punching and pulling your punches and pulling your kicks, then that's what you're going to do in a real fight if you have to defend yourself. Better to have equipment on and throw it full force. Better to practice, because as you practice, so you'll do. This life is practice for the one that's coming. Do you understand that? As you practice... So you do. He knows that, which is why a bunch of you aren't getting in because you're practicing stupidly. And he doesn't want that in the kingdom. You're not growing up. You're not you're squandering the talents he's given you and the gifts he's given you and the things he's given you. And don't think about it like talents the way you know, Christianity teaches you. I mean, you're given an understanding of Sabbath. Understand, all the Torah you're given, that's a talent. That's a gift he's given you. He opened and revealed to you these things. What are you doing with it? What do you do with it? He's given you all kinds of understanding about relationships. What do you do with it? He's given you all kinds of understandings about him. What do you do with it? What are you doing with it? And so, you know, you're showing him right now, if I give you forever, this is what you're going to do. He's saying in his head, if I, if I give that person forever, that's what I'm going to be stuck with forever. Okay? And I, I'm trying to get your attention because you guys are still goofing off too much. Now, I'm not saying goofing off like you can't have downtime and fun. I'm saying, but you're not doing what you need to in the three major areas of your life. You're not doing what you need to relationship-wise. By the way, relationships can be a lot better if there is some downtime together. If you have fun together. That's with your spouse or your children or your friends. Relationships are important that you have some of that downtime. But you need to understand all of the factors and elements that a relationship needs, all the factors that your financial life needs, right? All the factors that you are, um, will add health into it, all your health needs. That's the fourth major area of your life. Don't, look, he gave you this. By the way, do we not understand that this is something he gave you? It's supposed to be the temple of the living Elohim, right? First Corinthians 6, do you not know that you're bought with a price, that you are the temple? How do you treat your body? If you don't respect the thing he gave you, why would he think that you're going to respect anything? Okay. I'm just saying. Some of you know what that's like. You give your child a car, and then you go see what a disaster it is six months later. They don't, <laughs> when it says here, wicked and lazy, how about I'm going to add a word to it. You wicked, lazy, and irresponsible servant. You got to show him that you're responsible, that you know how to have responsibility for your life and for the things he gave you. When he says trustworthy, he's saying you were responsible with what I gave you. Are you responsible with what he gives you? 
And we're not talking about like gifts of knowledge and gifts of this and gifts of that. No, we're talking about just life. He's given you all you need to be able to have relationships, the finances to live, health decisions, and vertical decisions. Okay, we'll just stick with those four areas. There's more areas of life, I know that, but let's just stick with that. He's given you what you, you know. By the way, he's given you some of that through my mouth. I'm the one here telling you that these are things he's gotten for you. Amen. What are you going to do with it, though? You're going to go home and say, well, that was really nice, and he smacked me pretty hard, and then forget about it after that. Okay? Or are you going to find the discipline to apply? Okay, by the way, we're going to put another word in here. You wicked, lazy, irresponsible, and undisciplined servant. You know what has to be disciplined first? Your mind. A disciplined mind takes the four ta five talents and makes them into ten. The disciplined mind takes the two and makes it into four. Okay? The undisciplined mind just buries it. What is discipline anyway? Discipline is very simple. It's doing what has to get done whether you want to do it or not. Okay? That's it. Simple definition. Doing what needs to be done whether you want to or not. Okay? That's discipline. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I'm going to use me as an example, okay? Because I've been undisciplined plenty and disciplined in certain areas. All right? I recently committed, again, to getting myself in, in, in losing a few pounds and getting into the shape that I need to get into so I can have a healthier time. Because as, as you get older and you get heavier, you know what it's like when you bend down to tie your own shoes. It could be a nightmare. All right? So I'm just saying is, I, I got done with that. But I also wanted to be committed to figuring out a eating plan that works for me, not a diet. Just a new way of eating. Now, once I already picked that, guess what? I got invited out to a wonderful Italian restaurant with appetizers, all, and it was all paid for and provided, right? Wonderful stuff. But I'd already committed that I wasn't eating those things. I was just going to eat the steak. And guess what? That's all I ate. But it took discipline. Not necessarily a lot of discipline, because I've already learned how to. When I'm, when I'm determined, I'm determined. But it still took discipline. Okay? Now, one of my favorite things is homemade chocolate chip cookies. Someone brought that to me last night as part of the Oneg. And I said, no. Because that's discipline. You don't have what you really need to have only because you're not disciplined in a lot of your areas. Not all areas, but a lot of it's because you don't have the discipline. Okay? You're not at the weight you want. You're not at the health you want. You're not in the relationships you want. You're not, because even relationships take a ton of discipline. Amen. Okay? A ton. But you're undisciplined. Because you want what you want in that moment. Okay? I certainly could have said to myself, well, you know, I'll just cheat tonight. Okay? But I'm down 13 pounds since the 19th. Wow. Okay? And I'm not dieting. I changed certain things in my eating habits. I'm full. I eat, a, I eat plenty. Okay? I looked the other day at when I make a shake in the morning, it's 32 ounces. I drink the whole thing. So don't, don't think I'm not eating, okay? But I cut certain things out. And I'm very happy with what I'm eating. I can keep this going on forever. I'm happy with what I'm eating. But the thing is, it took discipline. Because I've lost more than this before. When I've told you guys that, sometimes here from the microphone. And then what did I get? Undisciplined. Okay? So I'm, I'm determined now to show you guys what it looks like to be disciplined. Because that's what you're lacking. All of your frustrations all come down to a discipline problem. All the weaknesses are only able to be there because you lack the discipline to overcome the weakness. So some of you think, well, I just need to get strong. No, you need to be strong about being disciplined. The weaknesses can be overcome by strength of discipline. Okay? You could say, oh, but you know, could you imagine being invited to a very nice Italian restaurant and having everything just laid out there for you? and not eating it. Elder was sitting right next to me. I didn't eat anything but the steak. Okay? I didn't complain about it. Didn't care. Why? Because I'd already made a decision. You could do that with anything in your life if you make a decision. You know what the word decision means? It means to cut off all other possibilities. So literally, you're cutting that out. 
So that meant there was no option for me to eat other stuff. I wasn't going to. I already knew where we were going. I looked at what was going to be there. And I said, look, I can eat the steak and that's fine. I didn't eat the other stuff that I didn't want to eat. Even if it was my favorite thing, it doesn't matter. It's discipline. Okay? And that's such a minor area of life to just, but I'm giving you an example. But you know what? I can now prove to myself that I have discipline, which means I can have discipline in other areas too. Pick something that you might think is trivial, have discipline with it, and then now you know you can have discipline in other areas. You know, there's a, a military, a former military guy wrote a book. One of the things he said about you know, having discipline in the book was, you need to start every day making your bed. Why? Because it means that you accomplish something first thing in the morning. You start your day having accomplished something that took discipline. It's not a bad thought, okay? I'm not claiming that's what I do. <laughs> But I'm just saying it's, it's something that you could do something that you would think is trivial, but you know what? You could feel good and say, I did something. And maybe you're in a hurry, but you do it anyway because that shows you have the discipline. The virgins, in the, the maidens in the first parable, why didn't they have oil? Because they lacked discipline. Why did the people mess up with the talents? A lack of discipline. And I've got another 40 verse, 30 verses to read. All right, let's see if we can do that in 17 minutes. All right, now, where are we? All right, so we're in uh, verse 30. So after he says, take away even what they possess, the ones who didn't do anything with what they were given, he says, and throw the worthless servant out into the outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, they get kicked outside the camp and said, nope. You were not what I was looking for for forever. Okay? You were not what I was looking for. And I hope everybody receives this. I've said it a lot, but you'll hear it again. There is one important factor of all of creation, as far as we are concerned as human beings. And that is, he's going to decide whether he wants to spend forever with you. And he's not going to use some dumb thing like, did you make an altar call? He's going to watch your life in relation to him and the choices and decisions you make in relations to him, right? That's what's happened here. He said, you, these servants that did this, he says, I don't want to spend forever with you. Kick them out. They're worthless and lazy. He actually said worthless. You are of no value to him if you're not going to trust him and obey him. You don't want to be worthless in his eyes. Oh, we're all God's children. We're all precious in his eyes. When you're a little baby, everybody's precious. At some point when you get older, you might lose a little bit of that preciousness based on your choices. You may still love your child when they're now 32 and doing dumb things, but they're not so precious anymore. Oh, isn't he so precious while he's screwing up his life and everybody's around him? Not so precious. You still love him though. I don't think he didn't, didn't love the ones he's throwing out. He said, look, you're worthless, throw them out. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, who's doing the weeping and gnashing of teeth? The person who realizes, I didn't get away with doing it my way. Okay, they could sing Frank Sinatra's My Way song out here while they're in outer darkness. You know, above everything else, I did it my way. Well, good for you. That makes you worthless. Okay, it's gonna make, it, it makes you worthless. All right, verse 31, and when the son of Adam comes into his esteem and all the set apart messengers with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his esteem and all the nations shall be gathered before him and he shall separate them from one from the other a shepherd, as, a sep uh, excuse me, as a shepherd separates sheep, sheep and goats. He's gonna set the sheep at his right and the goats on his left. Then the sovereign shall say to those on his right, come, you blessed of my father, and inherit the reign prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, by the way, this is one long conversation. He started at the beginning with the maidens. So he didn't just stop, go somewhere else and tell another story. This is one continuous thing. So he's trying to make a point, a cohesive point. He said, so whoever, whatever it is to deal with the sheep, he's saying, they're blessed of the father, they'll inherit the rain. For I was hungry, now he's gonna tell you why the sheep get that. <coughs> Excuse me. Why do the sheep get to hear those words? Because of what they did. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. 
naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Oh, they made some decisions. They did some things. Then the righteous shall answer him saying, Master, when did we see you? Oh, notice he calls him the righteous. You, you could miss this subtlety there. Why would he call him righteous? What does righteous mean? Those who are doing what's right. So these are also those that are righteous. Now notice he didn't say you kept Sabbath, you ate right, because those things should be basic and simple and easy. The next level is that you are dealing with their hunger, the thirst, the needs, the sick, etc. Not to neglect the others. What did he say about those who were tithing on even the leaves of the herbs, the mint and the anise, etc.? He said, but there are weightier matters. Not that you should ignore these other ones, but the next level is heavier, weightier. Yeshua said the same thing. It says, uh, you, know, you know, of old, don't murder. Okay, so I didn't kill anybody. That's simple. The weightier thing is not to hate. The weightier thing is not to have anger against your brother. So he's giving that heavier, weightier level of, on top of, not instead of. Okay? He says, so they're saying, the righteous are saying, well, when did we do these things? I'm going to paraphrase real quickly. Like, when did we see you hungry, feed you, thirst, and give you drink, etc.? And the sovereign answers in verse 40. He says to them, truly I say to you, insofar as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Hmm. So he's watching how we treat others. You know why? Because as below, so above. If you do it now, you're going to do it in the kingdom. Okay, if you don't do it now, he, think, he knows you're not going to do it in the kingdom. He's going to kick you out before that happens. He's so not going to spend forever with you doing that. Okay? So he's saying, I'm watching you. As you treat others, it's how you'll treat me. So that's the same thing. By the way, all of you who are disrespectful to leadership, he sees you being disrespectful to leadership. All leadership. How you treat your boss, he's still leadership. Treat the position with respect. You don't like your boss, you think he's a jerk, you think he's this and that and the other thing, that's fine. Don't disrespect the position. Because how you treat the position is how you'll treat the position. Okay? It's really important, this respect thing. Okay? And by the way, I'm gonna say something that's gonna mess up all of you husbands out there. All right? And you wives. Okay, number one, it is vitally important, wives, that you show your husband's respect. Number two, husbands, it's vitally important that you don't get upset when you don't get it because it's about them, not you. Follow that. If they don't respect you, that's on them, not for you to get upset. Because they're only making themselves look bad in the vertical. Now, you might not like being treated that way and you may have a relationship problem, that's fine. What I'm saying is, I see a bunch of guys that lose their everything just over, well, I didn't like the way she talked to me. She didn't talk to me with respect. Look, when people have said nobody talks to anybody with respect. Okay? So you need to get over that. I've had this problem. Okay? It's a normal thing for guys. Look, and ladies, you get the same problem with your children. Especially, the, well, my children aren't showing me any respect. Well, that's their problem, not yours. Get over it. Our father doesn't come down and smack us hard every time we don't show him respect, and we do that every day. Okay? But as we practice, what he said there, he says, as you've done to the least of these people out here, the ones I've called out, he said, then you've done it to me. So as you practice down here in this world that he's given us to play in and to practice in, he says, that's like doing it to me. Ladies, your husband should be treated like it's him. Husbands, you've got to treat her like it's him. Like, how would you treat him? Okay. Now, he says, he shall then say to those on the left, go away from me, accursed ones, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his messengers. By the way, the fire is everlasting, not the people. You throw people in an everlasting fire, guess what's going to happen to them? They burned up. Okay? For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. Thirsty, you gave me no drink. Stranger, you didn't take me in. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they shall also answer saying, Master, when did we see you with such, etc.?" He said, again, and as far as you did not do this to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. Mm -hmm. Last verse is, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. The punishment is everlasting, not the punishing. In other words, it's over. You don't get to come back 
It's the second death. The punishment, right? There's a punishment when Israel gets cast out of the, of the land. That was not a forever punishment. He said, I would bring you back. This is a forever punishment. You don't get to come back. Punishment, not punishing, okay? Go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. So everlasting life is being contra contrast to everlasting death. Do you get the difference? Okay, not everlasting suffering. What is he, all pissed off at everybody? He's going to punish them and torture them forever? That's, what kind of God do you think he is? Okay? He's saying, look, I've got, <laughs> Moses had this. I lay before you what? Life and death. Guess what the choice leads to? Either everlasting life or everlasting death. Not everlasting suffering and dying. Everlasting death. He's a merciful God. It's not merciful to make you torture forever when he's all mad at you. Only the most evil, vindictive, psycho sociopaths kidnap people, whatever they do, and torture them. Okay? Or evil, you know, racist, genocidal, whatevers who capture people and torture them. And we see this in lots of countries throughout our history. Okay? It's not about any particular color. It's just about whatever kind of thing. You see this in Africa, and it's black on black. You can see it in, like, Serbia and Croatia and all that stuff years ago, and it was white on white. Doesn't matter. But it's like, I, I don't like your whatever, beliefs, color, something, whatever it is, so I'm going to torture, kill, or whatever. You're going to believe your creator does that? Your creator is going to torture people. That was made up by the Catholic Church coming out of Dante's Inferno which was not, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is a fictional stuff. It's not a nonfiction book. Like, this was not like, like he went on a tour and could tell everybody all these different levels of hell. Dumb. Okay? It's fiction. And the church turned it into nonfiction. You have a contrast here. There's everlasting life and death that lasts forever. By the way, we also know that there's a mercy there because the dead know nothing. Scripture tells us that. So you'll know nothing forever. In other words, you had your chance. It's over. Hope you liked it, enjoyed it. That's it. Okay? So let's just understand this. There is a contrast between what you get for the right decision, what you get for the, but it's a contrast between death forever or life forever. Okay? That's it. Because we know there's a thing called a resurrection, which means that death is not forever under those circumstances. That death can have a second life because it's a resurrection, which means you are no longer dead and you're now alive. But he's saying for these, that death is permanent. There's nothing to look forward to. It's over. Now, for some of you, that might be fine. Party, do whatever dumb things you do, and then die and don't worry about having anything else. He gives you that choice, okay? But the contrast is here, very clearly. So, as you're connecting all of this together, all right, we have six minutes. I could actually squeeze this in. Let's go to James chapter two. So what is the oil? What is the oil? It's your works. It's the works based on what he's given you. What is the oil, right? It is your works. So hold on, let me go to James. All right, James chapter two, we start in verse 14. Tell me this, tell me if this doesn't match exactly with what's going on in Matthew 25. My brothers, what use is it for anyone to say he has belief but does not have works? The belief is unable to save him. And if a brother is, or sister is, oh, look at this, naked, needing so they need clothing, need food, and one says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them what they need, what use is it? He's talking about the exact same thing that Messiah talked about in Matthew 25 which James was there and heard him say, okay? He's saying, so also belief, if it doesn't have works, is in itself BS. It's, it's, it's not just dead, it's a lie. I'm gonna call it what it is. It's a lie. It's not like belief, you know, if it doesn't have works is dead. It means that it's, it's a lie. You claim something that's not true because the works would demonstrate whether it's true or not. Now, 
Some of you are like, he said BS. Well, be happy I didn't say the rest of it, which I might someday, so get over it. Because some of you just need to get over it, okay? And you call yourself a rabbi? I didn't call myself anything. He did, okay? Look, listen now, all right? But someone might say, you have belief and I have works. <laughs> that person's not understanding how this is. <laughs> show me your belief without your works and I'll show you my belief by my works. Okay? You, you demonstrate what you believe, the works is what you believe, not what your mouth says. Okay? I watch people tell me, oh, I'm Torah observant. And then I watch them do stuff that clearly is not Torah observant. So I'm not sure what they mean. That's why I'd rather call, everybody call themselves Torah pursuant because you're trying. Okay? Observant, which means you've accomplished and you've arrived. I think most of us, all of us, are just still struggling in some areas. So I would rather use the word pursuant. Okay? He says here, you believe that Elohim is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But do you wish to know, O foolish man, that the belief without the works is dead? He's saying, look, even demons believe. But what are the works? All right. He says, what? now he's going to show you belief in action. Was not Abraham our father? Isn't he known as the father of the faithful? And didn't you learn that in church? Our father Abraham, father of the faithful. Listen now. What was not he declared right by works when he offered Isaac up on the altar? Do you see that belief was working with his works? And by the works, the belief was perfected? Now wait. Listen to the next verse that every Christian church uses to go against works. James just uses it now to promote works. He says, and the scripture was filled which says, Abraham believed Elohim and it was reckoned to him for righteousness and he, called Elohim, he was called Elohim's friend. He just broke that whole argument. Because the church says, well, Abraham was declared righteous just because he believed. James did not say that. Neither did, in the Old Testament, did it actually say that. Okay? His works proved his belief. Now, look at the linkage James is making. You don't like James being in your Bible? I'm sorry. I know that messes up all of your faith-only people and works with, are, are, are evil or something. And works, you know, work is a four-letter word. All right. He's saying right here, you, you got this wrong. He says, the actions that Abraham does demonstrated that he believed, which is why he was righteous, because he did, he believed what Yahweh said, did what he said, that made him righteous. Okay? He wasn't righteous from some, I believe. I mean, all you people ever went to church and said, I be I'm a believer. Go back and listen to the song by the monkeys. I'm a believer. All right? Some of you are too young to even know what I'm talking about. All right? Of course, that one's talking about this guy being all excited about a girl, okay? But the thing is, you can believe all you want. Every one of you has believed somebody liked you who didn't really like you, and you were wrong. <laughs> oh, man, she likes me, I can tell. Nope. <laughs> anybody, anybody had that experience? Some of you thought someone liked you, and they didn't. Oh, yeah. Nope. You can believe anything you want. It doesn't make it true. But you claim that you believe something about yourself and you don't do it, the belief is dead. It's, it's garbage. It's, it's a lie. All right? Listen. It says, you see then that a man is declared right by belief. No, but that's what church taught you, isn't it? You're, you're declared right by belief. He says, no, he's declared right by works, not by belief alone. Now, of course, the works are going to demonstrate your beliefs. The belief is there. Listen to the teaching I have called, Are You Saved? The relationship between salvation, belief, or faith, and works. Okay? And this is all covered in there. Because after all, in verse 15, he said, um, not in verse 15, he says, um, at the end of verse 14, my brothers, what use is it if you say you have belief and don't have works? The belief is unable to deliver you. It's unable to save you. Wait a minute. But if you're already saved, why do you need that verse? That's why I gave you the teaching, are you saved? You're in the process of salvation. Well, I shouldn't say salvation. You're in the process of being delivered every day out of all kinds of junk. 
Salvation was already made available to all of you at the same time. Free of charge, you did nothing to deserve it, earn it, or anything else. But you don't understand, the reward, or the reward we read about in Matthew 25 is for those who do works. Your works are what determine the reward. Was that not clear in the three parables we read? What you do determines the reward, not salvation. Everybody gets thrown in the fire. Everybody that ends up in permanent death had salvation available to them. And that gift that was offered, they squandered it. They, didn't, they buried it, ignored it, did not do and bear fruit with it. Think of salvation as the talent. He gives you salvation. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, good. You're not going to get much out of that. It's going to be taken away from you. That's how we end up in that problem. It gets taken away from you. Oh, no. Once saved is always saved. That's a lie from the pit of whatever. Okay? That's a lie. Okay? Once eternal life is forever. Once you get there, it's forever. If you earn that, Oh, you guys hate when I say you have to earn this stuff. You do. I'm the only one out there teaching that maybe, but you do. All of this is earned. Get over it. Own it. Because otherwise you're going to find out in the end that I was right. Because that's what he told me to tell you. And now you're going to sit there weeping and gnashing of teeth. The death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah did one really, really important thing as far as you're concerned. It made everything you do matter, okay? Without that, nothing you did would matter, okay? But what he did now created an opportunity to understand that what you do actually matters. It's important. It makes a difference. Now listen to what he says here. He says, in the same way, this is verse 25, was not Rahab the whore also declared right by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? In other words, she believed that the person that was hiding was of value and needed to be protected. And so she did the right thing, which in, in where she lived was the wrong thing. She should have pointed him out to those guys based on where she lived and the situation in that town, right? But she didn't. She sent them out the other way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also the belief is dead without the works. Do we understand and believe this or not? Are you, this is revelation. Have, this is revealed to you. Are you receiving it? And are you going to own it and walk in it? Okay? All right? This is really important. All right, I'm going to throw out a few things really quickly here because I don't have anything enough to do for another part, so we're just going to run a little longer. All right. I want you to think of some, did I answer the question about the oil though? Do we know what the oil was? Okay. All right, so we understand. So, because you see how the other parables explain it? And it explains it very nicely. It's the works of Torah. I've given you this understanding, I've revealed to you, and you didn't do the works. Now you can't fill the lamp up by doing a whole bunch of works in one day and think you did anything. Okay. I mean, think about one day of doing the works as putting just a little bit of oil in your lamp. Of course, one day of breaking Torah takes the oil right back out. Okay? You need to get consistent. All right? You need to get consistent. Now, some areas of trustworthiness. I just want to throw these out there for you. All right? Some areas of trustworthiness. Obviously, one of them is, the most important one is, Torah observance. Are you guarding, remembering, keeping what he says to do? Uh, do you have the vertical? Are you trustworthy with that? Okay. How about community time with Yahweh? What's your attendance like? I don't care if you're not here physically. Do you watch online? On, I mean, are you, are you participating with some group somewhere every Shabbat? Have you committed to a community or do you just kind of float around and do whatever you want to do? This is a community activity. Okay. He's building a forever community. I used to teach that all the time at the feasts. These are, you know, and it's a code, preparing for the forever community kingdom thing, right? It's a community that will be forever. So this is a group activity done as an individual in a group context. So what's your attendance like at appointed time feasts, including the weekly Sabbath? When you're there, are you being attentive? Are you ready to receive? Can he trust you to show up ready to receive? Ears open, eyes open, awake. 
Are you actively interacting with the community? Some of you are real active, but you, what you're doing, unfortunately, is you're spreading and promoting your own beliefs about certain things instead of just being there for people. You're not gonna be, you know, what about the hungry, thirsty, sick? Now, I'm not saying literally, but how about if you don't know people, then you don't know what they need. How about getting to know people? Maybe you know what they need. And I'm not talking about money. You shouldn't be giving anybody money without asking us first because it may not be a good idea because you may be enabling or entitling something as opposed to helping. But almost all of you need relationships. You need people, you need friends, you need people to care about you, to be there to sit and listen and everything else. You need that. Are we being trustworthy to do that? Are you being trustworthy in serving? If you, if you volunteer to do something, do you show up? When you show up, do you do it the best you can? Do you give it the full effort? Do you have the right attitude? Sadly, there's still some of you that will come to a feast and do nothing. No volunteering. I don't understand that. I've got people with all kinds of health conditions and they all want to volunteer and they all do a lot of work. They do whatever they can, even if it means just sitting and punching tickets when they come in for meals and stuff, okay? They find a way, say, give me something to do. Listen, we're not even to servant yet. Wait till we start next time with part one of the servant part of this. Because... Remember, it's well done, good and trustworthy servant. Servant is a descriptor of the one that's good and trustworthy. The good and trustworthy in being a servant. Whatever that is, right? We're going to cover that in the next couple parts. Are you trustworthy in your personal time with Yahweh? In other words, do you spend time in vertical awareness? And by the way, I don't mean that it has to be formal all the time, Okay. I wake up in the morning before I even get out of the bed and I go ahead and I just kind of make sure I'm vertically aware. I may talk to him a little bit. I may just sit there quietly, whatever. But I try to start my day with some vertical awareness. I don't make it a big formal thing. I don't have to be in a certain position and my hands in a position and on my knees in a certain way, okay? I just want to make sure I start my day. You know what the first thing I do every day is? After that, my secular thing, my wife's always up before me. I go find her before I do anything else and say good morning to her. Because I want to start the day off with my relationships right. You understand? So first I talk to him, then I go find her. And I tell her good morning. And you know what else I do for all you guys who want better relationships? I do both with an optimistic excitement. I wake up in the morning optimistic and excited about my day and I want to start off talking to the one who's got rulership over my day. And then I want to go, so I go very excitedly going, good morning, honey bun, or something like that. Put a big smile on my face. Doesn't matter if I had a little creak in my body and I was feeling a little sore or something. I put that big smile on and give her an excited good morning. Then I go over and give her a hug and a kiss and say, good morning, all right? What about starting your day off that way? I don't care if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, start your day right. Don't get out of the bed if your day is wrong in your head so far, your head's all messed up. Stay in the bed till you get it right. Fix that before you get out of bed. And then go give an excited good morning to your spouse, whichever one you use up first. Then the other one, when they get up, go give that excited good morning. That starts your day really well, all right? Think about the one who's already awake, how, how great it feels to have the spouse get up and the first thing they do is want to come over and give you a big good morning. All right? I mean, that's good stuff. But are you trustworthy with what he's given you to do? A lot of it has to do with, like I said, sending personal time. You know, he expects that we're going to be caring for others in the kingdom. Do you, right? you understand that? Because as he does for us, we're going to do for others. So how do you treat those that you have in your relationships? You know, my, ask my daughter when she was in the house, as soon as I saw her, big hug, big kiss on the forehead. That was my spot, right? The forehead spot. And a big good morning and, you know, that, that feels great to get that right in the beginning of your day. So don't you think he really appreciates you start your day thinking of him? Instead of just thinking about work or this or that. Put things in the right order. Can you be trustworthy with all that? You know, how about with, you know, study time? Are you studying? And by studying, I don't mean you personally just reading the book. You need to do that, by the way. 
Because when I talk about things and you have no idea what I'm talking about because you never read it, that's a problem. When I talk about things, your brain should go, oh, I don't know exactly where that is, but I remember reading that. Or maybe you know at least what book it's in. Or maybe you know, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to know the exact address. Okay, that's something I need to know. Okay, but you should know, oh yeah, I remember that. I know that verse. Because you've read it. Then studying-wise, are you listening to the teachings? That's how you study. Are you going to have a... a um, What's the word I'm looking for? A guided study where you can go look at scripture and be guided through. Because guess what? Then you're having the, you know, Ephesians 4.11's whole point was to keep you away from confusion and every wind of teaching, etc. that you're going to get clarity. So you should have your Ephesians 4.11 teacher guide you through study. Because studying on your own has got only got a limited value because you're going to run, run into a ditch if you don't get some guidance. Because don't tell me any of you, when you came here and heard me teach, already knew everything I told you, okay? And you've been studying on your own and listening to other people all your life because you need the guided teaching, okay? I know nobody's ever taught you those three parables were connected, okay? Because I never heard it that way from anybody. That's the guided study, okay? And then, of course, because of the way it's talking about my brain, the spirit that he gives me to connect things, immediately heard the hungry and thirsty, etc. That's James 2. So I put quickly in my notes, go ahead and add James 2. Actually, in my notes, it says, consider adding James 2. Because that's what my note says. It says, break down these three parables, and it shows, shows the connection as to what the oil is in the second one. That's all my note says. And then don't forget to maybe go to James 2. But are we trustworthy? Are you trustworthy in your finances? That means things like tithes and offerings. It also means how you, those who have providing issues, like you have family to provide for, are you providing for them? Because a lot of you are not. And that should be your biggest priority, is to provide for them. And by the way, it's also going to be something he's watching. It's not are you just providing now, but are you planning to be able to provide later? Elder and I talk, talk to a lot of people about finances, and he's got his own you know, side business that he does with finances. And I'm telling you what, when we counsel people, almost nobody has any plan for later. They barely have a plan for now. Actually, most of them don't even have that. But even the ones who have a plan for now don't have a plan for later. Later is coming. If you're 40, 50, and 60, and 70 is coming. And by the way, most people live to a lot older than that. Are you planning for that? My mother's struggling right now a little bit. Thankfully, I can help her out because she didn't expect to be run out of money by 85. And she just turned 85. Remember, the average person lived to 70, 72 maybe. Now they're living a lot older. And her money was fine and plenty with her retirement and the stuff that the teachers union gave her and everything else from all of her career was fine into her 70s, even to barely around 80. But now it's running into about to run out because it's, it's an annuity type of thing, so it pays out of it until it's zero. It's about to go to zero. Now, thankfully, she's got a child that can help her. She's got three children that can help her, okay? And all three of us are doing plenty okay. But are you planning so that you don't need that? Okay, and some of you don't have a relationship with your children that would take care of you anyway. And maybe that's not your fault. I'm just saying you may just have children that are just not gonna take care of you. I talk to people all the time with children never gonna take care of them. But what are you planning? And if you think you're going to enjoy life on Social Security, go talk to some people that live on it. It's not so simple, okay? They, they can learn to do it, but it's not necessarily the joy of their life to be able to be limited to what they're limited to, all right? I, I have a little idea. I looked it up one time what my Social Security might look like. I am so thankful I'm not going to need it for anything. Oh, I'm sure I'll find something to spend it on. But it's not going to affect my lifestyle, because I'm planning for 70 and 75 and 80, okay? I'm 61 this month, all right? You know, any of you guys in your 30s and 40s, you better know 60's coming. And if you're working at something that's really physically grueling, you're not going to do that all your life. You've got to have a plan to get out of that. Some of you make a lot of money doing some really physical things. You're not doing that forever. You're going to feel like, you know what? I can't keep doing this. It's too hard on my body. So are you trustworthy to figure these things out? He gives you the brain 
and the drive and a physical body to do these things. And by the way, some of you have physical handicaps. You still got the brain and abilities to do things. Not everything requires a good functional physical body. All right? Go look at all that Stephen Hawking <laughs> accomplished. Okay, one of the greatest geniuses as far as high-level genius. I don't agree with everything he's ever said, but, you know, and he managed to do, and he was, you know, needed a computer to speak for him. Okay? And look at all the accomplished. He wrote books, did seminars, taught class. I mean, and he was way more handicapped than any of you. Okay? He needed machines to help him function in every possible way. But his brain still worked. He found some way to do something. Okay? But are you trustworthy with, he gave you this. He gave you that, that flesh suit. And you can do something. So what are you doing with it? Are you burying it? Or are you trying to multiply it into something? Some of you, it's funny. Some of you have plenty of money and don't tithe like you should. Others I know have almost no money are, are frustrated because you can't tithe. I wish I could switch those mindsets. Okay? Because those of you who got nothing, it's okay. Let us take care of you, work on having something. Those of you with something, you should be doing what you're supposed to do. And I'm telling you, your finances will be better and better and better when you have less money because you're giving it to the tithing. I don't know how it works that way, but it does. Anybody want to admit that it worked that way for them when they started tithing, that your finances are better? Okay. I know it doesn't make sense mathematically, but doors open. Ideas are inspired. You do things that end up making all the difference. Okay? Because I'll tell you what, first time I did the three tides, and I was a third tithe year, this is going back, I don't know, 1987 or 8 or something like that. Man, I didn't know how I was going to make my budget work with three tides. And I ended up with more money that year than the year before. Because <laughs> opportunities came up, doors open, and also, you know what else? I realized I needed to make more money. So I found ways to do it. So it pushes you a little bit. But are you trustworthy? You know? All the things that he gives you to do. Are you trustworthy in your eating? That's like knowing, looking at labels and everything else. Do you, are you trustworthy? So many things. Okay, so many things. So just, you know, you can go through anything in Scripture, any of the Torah stuff, and say, am I trustworthy? Can he count on me? All right? Can he count on me? All right, so let's go before the Father. This, that's the end of this part of the good and trustworthy servant. And next time we will can start off with part one and dealing with servant, okay? Father, we come before you. And Father, we are just, hopefully we're just receiving with everything we've got. Just openly, like a sponge, receiving this revelation you have for us so that, Father, we can then apply it and be trustworthy. The trustworthy in all the areas that you want us to be trustworthy, that we can understand. Thank you for the understanding of Matthew 25 and the three parables and what it means to have an empty lamp and what you want in it, which is our, our trustworthiness to do the works. So that when we get to that point when Yeshua comes, we have an oil-filled lamp full with all of our growth and works to the point where we're now so Yeshua-like. And Father, hopefully none of us who are listening are taking the idea that somehow works in itself is just scoring points somewhere. Works with the wrong attitude mean nothing also. Works with the, with the wrong understanding is not, you know, is not gonna go for it. You need the weightier things on top of it, which is why a lot of the works, Father, we're so thankful you gave us the one at the end where we understand it has to do with how we treat each other, lovingly feeding, giving drink to those who are thirsty, visiting those that are sick or in, infirmed in some way. So, Father, we want to thank you for giving us this clarity of what you expect from us so that you would want to spend eternity with us. So, Father, help us to have our, an openness to receive and do all that you have revealed. So, Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all glory and honor. In the name above all names, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. 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 All right.